Perfect. All right, so welcome everybody to Open Education Week at CSU Dominguez Hills. Uh, thank you for joining us for this faculty panel discussion about open educational resources, OER, uh, and how they're used here at CSUDH. My name is Hallie Claussen. I use she, her pronouns, and I am your ALS librarian, which stands for Affordable Learning Solutions. Basically, my job is to work with faculty to try and find affordable alternatives or options for course materials and try to save students money. Uh, I want to thank my three guests who have volunteered to share their experience with using OER resources in their courses. Uh, and this panel is being recorded and will be made available on the ALS website for anyone who couldn't be here today. Uh, so with all that out of the way, uh, let's go around and have everybody introduce themselves. Uh, please mention your name and department. Um, and Adam got here first, so let's go ahead and start with him. Uh, my name is Adam Sanford, and I am a long-term lecturer in the sociology department. Um, and I have a PhD from, Cal uh, from the University of California, Riverside. And one of my main motivations uh, in creating affordable learning solutions for my students is I remember what it was like to be a poor student who didn't get their uh, student loan refund until three weeks after classes started when you need a book on the first day of class. And I just figure it makes sense to make sure that our students have the materials that they need for the first few weeks of school, you know, if nothing else. Because too often, you know, I would not have the book for three weeks because I was waiting for my refund. In the meantime, what am I supposed to do? You know, hope that I get it right? So, I re so I remember being an undergrad and, and I really deeply sympathize with that thing. Okay. All right, who wants to go next? Okay. No, so Bob first. <laughs> yeah. All right, I'm, I'm Sirban Rayano. I'm a professor in the mathematics department and uh, I have a long involvement with uh, affordable solutions. Uh, so my story starts in 2006. So I would be happy to elaborate on that later on. Wonderful, thank you. All right, last but not least. Uh, okay, um, I'm Wei Yan Kong, uh, also a professor from the math department. <laughs> Two representatives from the math department. <laughs> and uh, I, I think I have been involved in the affordable learning solution for a while too. I forgot how long, but <laughs> for a while. Um, it's good. I mean, nowadays, I think um, many materials, you know, the, the free materials or the open source materials is, is quite good. I mean, you know, books, some books are good, but some, um, open source and, and pu publicly available resources is as good, okay? Um, and they incorporate many, like for in mathematics, they incorporate some technology. You can um, do some computations on the on those things, like through the interface of a web page. So yeah, that, that on top of that, they have some new things than uh, just an old textbook can offer, right? So, yeah. Fantastic, yeah. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and can you share with us, when did you first hear about OER and what was it, a, Adam, answer this a little bit, but what about OER got you interested in wanting to use it? Um, let's start with Sarban. Okay, so as I said, I started in the spring of 2006. I had to choose, uh, a book for a, a new class I was teaching uh, here at Dominguez Hills, which was uh, a complex analysis. And I chose a book by a professor at Georgia Tech. Um, his name was George Kane. And I liked the book a lot and I adopted it. And uh, I, inspired by that, I chose another book uh, for an, another of my classes for which I was using a a printed book, and that was Linear Algebra by Keith uh, Matthews, who was a professor at the University of Queensland in Australia. And uh, this was the first, uh, my first, and I, I liked the experience a lot. And I, I became friends with the two uh, authors. Um, I kept using these two books. And then, uh, do, do you want me to stop here or I can? Should I tell the whole story? Or... Up to you, yeah. 
it. If you want to share the whole story, yeah, go for it. Okay, so uh, so that was the first, and then um, in 2012, uh, my specialty is uh, uh, algebra, and I was when I when I came here, I, I tended to use the books that were used in the department before me because I I looked at them, I liked them. The problem with the abstract algebra book is that in 2012 uh, came a third edition of the book that I was using, and the second edition costed about fifty dollars, and the third edition came out for two hundred and forty-two dollars. And then I said, "Okay, that's uh, that's it. I'm going to." Inspired by the, the other two guys, I said, "I'm going to write my own uh, my own book." So I started to use that and write that in 2013. It took like six years to finish, but I've been using it every year. Congratulations. Uh, That's okay. awesome. So I, I needed a, actually a sabbatical to finish. I finished it in 2019. And uh, oh, can I, can I share the screen? Uh, sure, yeah. Uh, let me go ahead and um, enable. Go ahead. So uh, Firefox was oh, I cannot. Uh, Is it allowing you to share? Uh, no, I wanted to share just the uh, Firefox, but it's okay. I'm going to to do the whole screen. Okay, so. Uh, this is the first book I used by George Kane, right? The Complex Analysis. It, uh, he passed away, unfortunately, in 2015, but his book is, they took out his book and I, I called the department. I said, no, you should leave it on because people are still using it. This is the, uh, the Linear Algebra um, book. And then uh, uh, my book uh, became available, as I said, online in, uh, on my website in 2019, and then during the pandemic, some of some students asked me to to sell a print version, which I did. So this is the the Amazon. Uh, you can see it's uh, it's royalty free, right? So it costs five dollars and forty eight cents. So that's not bad at all. Strictly printing costs, not nothing. Yeah. So this is the um, this is what it looks like. I also have uh, this is a a pandemic version, right? Because I was using the, it's a shorter version which sells for $3.58. And uh, okay, about yeah. uh, the other classes that I'm teaching, uh, uh, calculus, I, I had a hard time finding a book that I liked. So an online book, and it took a while to find one, but I finally found it in 2019. It's a book. Uh, written at the University of British Columbia. I, I became friends with the, uh, the main author as well, and I've been using it ever since. I'm really happy about it. So, so this is the, the website. So you have like four books and they are huge. They have solved problems. Mm -hmm. So right now I've been uh, exclusively uh, open access for a, for, a, for a while. I mean, since 2019 until the present, I'm exclusively using online. Uh, That's awesome. Online books. Yeah. And then since uh, uh, I would like to mention something else that I did, which is also open access, and uh, it's more on the side of, uh, um, I think they, uh, it's, uh, what, what do they call that? Uh, I, I forgot. It's, uh, uh, it's a research for undergraduates. Um, so I started a journal. Um, it's called the Pump Journal of Undergraduate Research. So it has a, um, a, a, another page. Let's, uh, let's do that. So yeah, one of the things I, des I definitely want to talk about, and it's great, you've already covered it, uh, is how to find um, these kinds of materials. So I do want to go to Adam uh, and Wayan, but um, uh, oh, you got it. Yeah. 
so this is uh, this is the journal, and it's also selling on uh, on Amazon because it's important for students who are first time authors to see the, the their name in print, right? And it also sells. Uh, we're selling two versions, like the black and white, which you see is like six dollars and twenty four, but the colored version is a lot more expensive. So uh, the the colored one is uh, fifteen eighty eight. It's the same book, but it's uh, and uh, yeah, so this is a, a high quality uh, journal, a research journal. It's indexed by the two main uh, publications, uh, Math Reviews in the United States and the Central Blood in Europe. Uh, it has uh, uh, an editorial board with experts from uh, a lot of countries, the uh, United States, Canada, the UK, Belgium, Argentina, Japan, Romania, it published papers by uh, authors in the United States, China, India, Finland, the Netherlands, the UK, Austria, um, Thailand, uh, Thailand, I swear. <laughs> I, uh, I don't want it. I'll, I'll keep, I'll keep it. Um, I'll stay out of politics. But anyway, <laughs> Thailand and Israel. And uh, wow, yeah. that's and for for uh, Dominguez Hills students published papers in there as well. So that's uh, that's a great opportunity that, for the students. That's my, yeah, that, that's my story. So uh, wonderful. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Uh, who wants to follow that up? Go ahead, Adam. So I um, asking me when I started doing this is. The answer is I'm not sure um, because I was only given intro classes, I think I want to say four years ago, maybe. And by then I was already doing an awful lot of other progressive pedagogy and changing up how I do things in class. You know, I do not stand and lecture in front of the class. They get recorded lectures. We have a flipped classroom. And so OER just seemed like, you know, the natural next step. But the only place I've been able to do any kind of uh, OER that's available out there is in my intro classes. And that is one of the things that I do want us to talk about, I hope, in this panel is the fact that there's kind of a paucity of OER for anything beyond an intro or entry level, you know, very basic beginners class. So I use the OpenStax uh, Intro to Sociology second edition, and I use that with both my 101 and my 102 classes. Um, as far as other kinds of OER, I create a lot of content for my students. So um, I try to make it so that they don't have to get the textbook to pass the class. And I do an intense amount of work on prepping so that they have a video for every chapter that I would have covered in a book. I create a video on here is what we're talking about. Here's a list of terms and concepts from that video lecture. Make sure you do the terms and concepts. You know, I try to make sure that the um, assignments that they get can be used as study tools and can do double and triple duty so that they can use them to practice work or they can use them to get feedback on what they're doing. Um, and this kind of goes probably beyond, uh, you know, uh, uh, OER, but I do a lot to make sure that my students don't have to empty their wallet every time they need to get materials from my class. So I write a lot of my own materials, as Servan talked about writing his own book. Um, I have been talking with a friend of mine who is, like me, a criminologist, about maybe we could put together a book, you know, an OER book for criminologists. But for that, we'd really like to get a grant to support doing that so that we could actually put it out there. I don't know how the people on OpenStax did it. I mean, they made it free, but I'm assuming they got compensated at some point. And... Um, and I think that, you know, maybe if we're going to compensate people for writing textbooks, it should be grant support so that they can write the textbook and, and then it can be made free or very low cost for students so that they have access to the, you know, to the work that they need to have access to without, you know, I mean, I really, I really have a problem with, oh, we have a new edition of the textbook. We've changed one paragraph in one chapter, and now we want you to buy this $300 textbook. And it's like, no, I'm not cool with that. You know, and I would like to be able to have it something where we can maintain it and then go into the website and add that one paragraph so that the students have, oh, this new finding, you know, that only takes a paragraph in one chapter of a giant textbook. 
So, um, so like I said, I do provide a lot of uh, content for my students that I have created from all of the various um, uh, sources that I use. And then I just sort of synthesize it and put it into a video lecture and I give them a list of terms and concepts that they can download and then go back through the lecture and find all those terms and concepts. Um, not quite as good as an OER textbook, but it's what I can do, so it's what I do. It's all the pieces, just maybe not put quite together yet. Right, and I have, to, like I said, I have a colleague who is a criminologist who he and I have been talking about, hey, let's write a textbook. But, you know, writing a textbook is not something you do in a month. It's not even something you do in a semester. It's That's a couple of years worth of work. So, and we don't have the time right now. We're both lecturers, you know, we're both adjuncts, and teaching has to be the first thing we do, and this is what we do when we get time, and there's not a lot of time, so. Yeah, I hear that for sure. Um, all right, Wayan, would you like to take over from there? Oh, I think you're still muted. Yes, <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah, uh, I think, like Adams, I, I start from uh, writing my own material a while ago, so I forgot <laughs> how long ago, but uh, yeah, a while ago. And then uh, for some, yeah, I have occasions that um, um, there was a sort of um, computer, like software, algebra software, the open source called Sage. Um, I think around 2010, 2011, they were looking for people to um, try out the, um, the software to teach like number fee. Well, I, I, I think I applied for teaching number theory and uh, I said I will help them to uh, do the testing of the software. So this is also a kind of, so besides book, right? This is also a kind of like open source, um, like free resource for students. Um, so uh, maybe I should share the screen as well. Um, so. Uh, sure, yeah. I wanna show us what you're, what you're working with. And that's one of the real advantages of OER, right? Is that it can really encompass, obviously full, more traditional style textbooks, but also videos and software and homework uh, programs and things like that. Yes. Sage math. There we go. Yes, yes. So this is like, um, you know, you can do all sorts of computations with this. And, um, and we also have a, well, just a little advertisement. So uh, I run a server. This is host in our school server. So this is another version of the same materials, basically the same material, like same kind of software behind, okay? And this CoCal Math, yeah, so I can teach a course with it uh, in graph theory, so people can do all sorts of computations um, with this kind of software. Um, so besides that, um, I also use some materials like books. Um, for example, let me see. Uh, I should remember this. Because I'm teaching a few courses. All of them are using some uh, free materials. And for example, um, discrete math, um, I'm using like two different types of textbooks. Uh, both of them are online. And um, the nice thing about this setting is, um, let me give you an example. I think, uh, let me see. So you can sort of link some um, <clears throat> exercise directly to the page. So I think I think we're just seeing your um, course page. Oh. oh, okay. Sorry. I guess it's open on a new page. Ah. So when I share it, I mean I should share the. You gotta share that when you yeah. It. Right. I should share the. Give me a second. Sorry. Um, maybe I should share the window. Can I share the? Oh, maybe I should share the entire screen. Share. All right. So you're probably seeing yourself. Are you seeing a book? 
right now with some yes. exercises. Yep. Now we see the exercises. Perfect. Right. Um, so you can learn. I mean, this kind of platform is nice. Besides, this can be done with a traditional textbook, right? Because you can have exercise, but the student can do the exercise and submit it and check for the answers. Um, you see that? So you can do some, how many subsets here in total? So you can type uh, two to the power six, and then you can check answers. It will tell you, well, you did it right. I haven't done the, uh, the other three. So, so this is uh, something good about, um, I think, open source uh, and, and this newer technology. And uh, for calculus, so this is a recommendation to Savant. <laughs> I don't know whether you know this book. Um, it seems to be okay. So, uh, so that's another calculus textbook like, written in um, open source that you can use. I think they list uh, various things. You have graph. Uh, I, I do think they incorporate some, I don't know, I, don't, I forgot on what's top of my head. Where they, so the they also of? incorporate some interactive um, exercise the here. Coordinate calculus, this one. Okay. Do you see that? Yeah. Okay. And um, well, it's not advertisement, but <laughs> I'm turning my notes into something like that. It's very similar. Okay, so this is by me. <laughs> uh, but right, it's far away from, you know, it, it took you six years, right? So I just start. So uh, yeah, so that's some things on my web page. You can check it out. I, I'm just doing calculus too, since I'm teaching it <laughs> right now. Um, but there's several things. And I taught yeah. probability. So many resources. Um, and this, this book are pretty good um, quality, I would say. And the students seems to enjoy them. Well, at least they don't need to pay for it. So that's a good thing. Uh, if, the, if the material is as good, so that's, that's important, right? I mean, one need to check to make sure that these things are, are good. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Finding that quality control. Um, right, right. Because there's lots of materials, right? I mean, if you go to YouTube, there's tons of them, right? Some, some, I mean, it should be the, some duty or job of the professors to mm -hmm. sort of yeah, use their expertise to screen for good uh, quality materials. Yeah. Right, exactly, yeah. So that, that kind of actually leads into one of my other questions, which is, so it sounds like in the math field, there are lots of things that are available at different levels, uh, you know, going to calculus and probability and all of those different subjects that you might be teaching. Um, what has been your experience at Dominguez Hills specifically as far as have you seen much uptake in OER more broadly? Is Does it seem to be limited to your department? I know Adam mentioned the uh, problem where there's a lot of things available for intro classes, but nothing for the more advanced topics. Um, anybody want to speak to sort of the uptake at DH? Sort of what are those conversations that you're hearing here on campus? Yeah, I, first I wanted to say that I remember the term that I was missing earlier. It's called high impact practices. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the journal would fit into that category, uh, high impact practices and open access resources. Sure. So uh, in the math department, at least, I mean, the, the, I, I think I can safely say that everybody's using some sort, some form of uh, open access. Uh, absolutely, every. I'm. Uh, I agree. <laughs> almost. I, 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 I don't know. Agree. Yeah, they my, use my general feeling that a lot of people are are using open access, and there is a constant, uh, you know, discussion about these and. Uh, the thing that Wei An did uh, here, right? He said, "Okay, I don't know if you know about this or whatever." It happens all the time in the department, so uh, there's definitely a lot of interest uh, in this kind of uh, resources. 
that's my experience at least i can say i've seen the spreadsheet for your for your department that your chair sent over to me for our reporting and yes oh. it's like most most yeah. of the classes uh have some kind of open stacks or open textbooks sorry adam i interrupted you that's okay i was going to say that as a person who is a a an adjunct a lecturer and b we have been off campus up until, up until last semester for two years um so last semester, even though we were on campus, we didn't have like in-person meetings. There wasn't walking through the halls and seeing people in their offices. You know, people were very still much. I come to class, I come to campus, I teach class, I go home. And so in terms of the conversation, I my answer is I don't know. I don't know what my department has or has not done. Um, I know that for me, it's more a personal motivation than a motivation for, you know, doing what all the other kids are doing kind of thing. You know, it's not, it's not that simple. It's not as simple as saying, well, everybody else in my department is doing this, so I'm going to too. For me, it was more compassion for the students and saying, how can I make their lives even a little bit less difficult? And that is also what's motivating me and my colleague, um, uh, who is my co-host on my podcast, to put together a criminology uh, open access textbook. But like I said, funding is important first. I mean, criminal, and, and also when you say, you know, intro versus advanced. I think that that might refer better to STEM courses because you build on, build on, build on. But in sociology, it's more, not that it's advanced so much as in it's a deeper dive in a particular aspect. Because if you're in sociology 101, you're gonna talk about criminology. You're gonna mm -hmm. talk about political sociology. You're gonna talk about economic sociology. You know, these are all things that are part of the intro class. And then most of what we think of as you know electives are let's do a much deeper dive into crim and so we go beyond just saying here are four main theorists and now you're talking about 25 theorists mm -hmm. who have all done different work in the field and you're digging into their work but i don't think of that as more advanced just more specialized sure. right? yeah generalist versus specialized is maybe which a more may, accurate which may be why you math gentlemen have all these OER resources because the obvious logical next step after algebra is whatever it is, and the students need that. But in sociology, we give them intro, and then they could go any number of directions. And so then where even is the priority? You know, are we gonna do a race and gender OER? Are we gonna do a gender OER? Are we gonna do a race OER? Are we going to do a crim OER? You know, there's so many places that we could and I think I I think I emailed you about this, Hallie, the idea that maybe we should offer some grants to our faculty who have these knowledge bases to yeah. say, hey, could you put together an OER on race? You know, could you put together an OER on gender? Could you put together an yeah. OER on crim and, you know, see what we could do about that? And I think that that's a valid thing to do, but I think we also need to recognize that the discipline you're in, it may change what we mean when we say open education resource and affordable learning solution. And that what it looks like in the math department may look very different in say in the english department or let's say in an art history class you know again with an art history class which period of time are we talking about which artistic movement are we talking about right and so and that won't be a more advanced book but it will have to be something that is written by someone who specializes in say cubism right yeah. and so i think that might be something we want to you know maybe not in this panel but something that in general should be considered when we talk about affordable learning solutions and open education resources is what does the discipline require, yeah. you know, and, and even in psychology, it, it's STEM, but it doesn't build the way that math does. It doesn't build the way that physics or chemistry does, right? It's still STEM, but the field is different. And so you have to decide, you know, are we going to do OER on abnormal psych? Are we going to do OER on Freud? Are we going to, you know, and again, you gotta, you gotta think about how it isn't more uh, advanced so much as more, spe more specific. And I hope I'm not repeating myself over and over again, but this is how my brain works, I apologize. Yeah, no, I think that makes a lot of sense that coming to it from a very different perspective and a different discipline is going to make a big difference. Yeah. Um, so building off what you were talking about, compassion for students, uh, I feel like you touched a little bit, each of you, on this, but how have your students responded to your use of OER? Have you gotten specific feedback? Are they just kind of like, eh, it's fine? Or 
I'm going to wait for my colleagues to go because I took, I, I talked first, so I'll let. I'll let uh, my experience is, uh, is, is just like anything, it depends on the materials. So even like the books or the, um, they're mostly the books, right? You use uh, like open source or it's freely accessible. I mean, the students usually react to the content, right? Some books is easier to read and some books are harder to read. So it's not, like specific of whether it's uh, freely available or not. This experience. Yeah. Personally, I, I experienced some uh, resistance on the part of the students. Uh, many of them uh, want to see the, you know, the 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 um, the book in the, to have the book in their hands, and this is why they asked me to to have a print uh, version of it. Uh, but uh, it's also math and it's pretty hard. And uh, you know, when it gets hard, uh, it's very easy to blame the book, right? And say, okay, so <laughs> what other, that everybody's looking for a magic book that will do the work for you, right? And uh, I always tell them, look, if I, if I had a shot and give you a shot and then you know calculus, I will not be here. I would be on my private island, you know. <laughs> tell the shot to everybody and I would be, I will live happily ever after. So uh, there, there is some resistance definitely, right? So, and there, there's also something that I think it started to change uh, slowly. Uh, Students do not really trust you that you, you chose the best thing for them, right? They think that if it's free, it has like less value. Yeah. And, uh, and it's absolutely not true. So this is why I, 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 I waited with my calculus uh, class for, for years. I've been looking between uh, 2006 and 2019 when I found that book at British Columbia. I've been looking every year for a book that I liked right? That is comparable. What does it mean that I like? That is comparable uh, to the standard textbooks like uh, Stewart or Finney and Thomas, right? I mean, the same quality level. So that is six to uh, 19. That's 13 years that I've been looking and I, I couldn't find one. So I, I kept using Stewart. And what I did, and that might be a good. Uh, the Stewart is a standard calculus textbook for yeah. the yeah. for the audience. So, that, because it's no, no. so there are two standard uh, calc uh, in calculus North America. in North America. One of them is Stewart, and the other one is Finney or Thomas or Finney and Thomas or Thomas and Finney or all the combinations. Right? Even I've heard of Finney Thomas. Yeah. So that's uh, if if you if you use one of these, right? Like when I was using Stewart, I. Uh, you know what uh, what publishing houses do uh, from time to time they uh, they do another edition and they scramble the problem so that you cannot use the older edition so mm -hmm. what i what i used to do i let them use the older editions but with the uh, older syllabus okay so they paid they end up, ended up paying like four dollars for the old edition on amazon and they were using the old edition because the problems were the same right so you just I did the work of matching the problems, right? But I, I set up one, only one rule so you don't talk about problems by numbers because this is what mm. students do. Can you do 13, right? So you cannot do that using the old edition. But other than that, you can do whatever you want, right? So if you come to, you can, if you want to do, you can, can you do 13? You can come to office hours and refer to the old edition like that. But if, if you're in class, you have to find what 13 means in the new edition and sure. you, can ask, can you do X, right? Yeah. So that's another, that's, that was my, my uh, you know, my second choice, right? My mm -hmm. plan B. While the, in the 13 years, I couldn't find a book that I liked, right? But uh, now that I found this, uh, it's, it's not that it's okay, because I, I would never use a book that it's okay. I mean, I really like this a lot, th this book. So that's the thing. Yeah. So if you can find one that you really like, fine. If not, you can do the other things. For me, I had a student just today say the thing that they hate about OER is that there is no physical textbook. Mm -hmm. 
And I said, well, it's the choice between a $250 textbook that you can hold in your hands or a free one that you can bring up on any web browser or phone or tablet. And they're all, yeah, no, I know, but you want a book. You want to show that your money went somewhere, right? Um, and you want to show that your time is being spent as, you know, as servant just implied on something worthwhile. Um, one of the ways that I have kind of gotten around that with my students is to say, well, so you can certainly get an older edition of an intro textbook, but it's not going to match exactly. I am not going to take the time to go through the third edition of the book that we are currently using the fifth edition of to say, here are the five places where it's different. I'm just not, I don't have that kind of time. I don't have that kind of energy. As you have probably noticed, I've been my eyes because I'm exhausted today too. So I don't mean to nod off during this <laughs> panel and I'm not bored by anything anyone's saying. Um, it's just that, you know, I've, I've got, I've had students who tell me that they really appreciate that the book is free, but like Servan was saying, you know, they, they also express some concern that is it really worth reading if it's just an online free textbook. And so I think that one thing that will change that is if we can show, hey, look, I wrote this textbook or I was part of the team that put this textbook together, right? If we can do that, you know, Servan, like if you could show them this book is something that I wrote and you know you can trust me because I know what I'm talking about. And you spent six years doing it. Mm -hmm. Like uh, for my students, although it's not specifically disciplinary related, I do a lot of writing. My classes are all writing intensive, including the intro classes. And a lot of students have no idea how to write a research paper or even, you know, a simple uh, essay. And so I, over the past mm, probably 10 plus years, have developed a set of five writers workshops that I am planning at some point in my copious free time uh, to turn into a book that I can then make available on Amazon for about five or 10 bucks to say, here is the way that you do it in the social sciences. Because writing a research paper is also different depending on what discipline you're in again, right? So if you're in a humanities discipline, they want you to use a lot of original texts, right? You know, for, you know, uh, primary sources, as they call them. But if you're in uh, sociology or in anthropology or in psychology, they're going to want you to show that you've read the research and that you can synthesize the research to basically say, here is a problem and here are three solutions for it. But if you're in math or physics, I'm not even sure if that approach would, I would assume that that would approach would work in math or physics. You know, here is a problem and here's a possible solution to it. And here's all the research that I did. And I train them to write it in a certain way. And I suppose that that also qualifies as OER because then they don't have to get, you know, a writing textbook for my class, but they do have to use the resources that I create and give to them and say, here's how you do the thing. You know, here's how you develop the argument that allows you to then find the sources that allows you to then um, address the important audience. And here's how you figure out who your audience is. And, all those things that are usually not talked about in say an intro to comp class, you know, they're, they're focusing on writing an essay. And so one of the things I have to talk about too is that the voice and the, um, the writing style in say a sociology uh, paper for a research paper is very different than a humanities essay, or for that matter, a lab report for your chem class, right? And I've had students say to me, I thought writing was just writing. You know, and so then you provide OER that you've created yourself on here are the differences and here's why you need to write this way in my class and in your other social science classes. And this is why you need to write that way in your humanities classes. And this is why your, your math teachers aren't going to put up with all of those vocabulary words. They don't want them. You know, your, your chem teacher doesn't care how floral it smells. That's not what the point is. You know, you're not going to be writing all these fancy words. You're going to be very straight into the point. And, um, and I really wish that I could create an OER kind of resource for teachers who have to take, you know, raw first years and even raw second and third years who have avoided writing in their classes so that they can say, look, here's a guideline. Here's a step-by-step -step process to get to that research paper. And then you can finesse it. And, you know, this is getting more into, you know, the sociology of teaching and learning. So I should probably stop, but I think that's one of the things that's going to be very valuable. Uh, with using um, you know ALS and OER is allowing the student to have resources that don't cost an arm and a leg so that they can learn what they need to learn in order to move forward in their their career program and their degree program because so many of them just get caught up with oh the algebra book costs too much 
how am I going to pass, you know, Dr. Ryan's course when I don't have the book and I can't get the book and the older edition doesn't have the right problems in it or doesn't explain it the way he did in class or, you know, whatever the problem is. Um, and I think that's one of the places where I would hope we would start seeing funding for professors to write our own books and make them low cost or no cost to the students after we've been given a grant to write the book. Yeah. That's, that's I think, an, an issue that needs to be addressed. Yeah, for sure. Well, uh, that doesn't quite lead in, but I do want to touch on one thing before we run out of time. Um, so one of my questions is, what recommendations would you have for any other faculty members who want to use OER in their classes but just don't know where to start? Um, and thinking of it, especially in terms of if you're a young, if you're a newer professor, if you're a lecturer, uh, if you are less established and don't have friends with, uh, uh, don't have friends who've written their own textbooks yet, um, where do you even look? Well, I would start with you, Allie. <laughs> well, yes, thank you. Just like I tell my students, you know, if you want to find the research, you go to the librarian first because they'll guide you on how to do that. Since you are our point person on this campus, I would say go talk to Hallie Clausen first to find out what's already there. But then when you find, like I have found, for example, that the only stuff that's available is for your intro class and you're not teaching any intro classes in your field, you're, all, you're teaching all of these deep dives on various topics, then it might be worth investigating you know, getting a grant and writing your own. And in the meantime, creating your own content for the students. Or at minimum, like Servan was saying, you know, be willing to allow older editions. Like with the CRIM class, I will tell students we're currently using, uh, I think it's Hagen, and the current um, edition of that is 10. So I will go all the way back to seven, because I have seven, eight, and nine, because I've gotten them from the publishers. And so if a student says, uh, you know, we're in chapter six, okay, which edition are you using? And then I can answer their question because I can go to that part. And I give them everything that I think they need to know about in my lectures. So I treat the book more as a supplement and less as a central part of the class. I, I treat the resources as this is supplemental. You're going to get the majority of what you need in the lectures and in the discussions and in the in-class activities. And so if you are having a question about a specific concept, like say, anomie, and the research and the uh, lecture didn't make it clear then yeah you can go to the textbook flip through it and find out what that means and then you have something to base your questions on when you come and talk to me in office hours or send me an email so and i think so i think this is i would also tell my my fictional colleague you're going to have to change your thinking about what the important parts of your class are because the book should never be the central part of the class anyway the resources should never be the central part of the class anyway those should be what the students can fall back on if they're not sure what happened during lecture or what happened during lab or what happened during a discussion section. You know, it should not be the, the first go-to. And then if there isn't an OER book out there, put in for a grant, write your own. We need your talent, we need your knowledge and so do the students. Yeah, there's a reason you're teaching. Do either of you wanna jump in from a math perspective? Um, I saw there was a link there in the chat. <laughs> AI yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, that's I I usually start just by googling, <laughs> just like everyone else. I mean, if I have no idea this area, so the online thing. I mean, the OER, right? Usually, uh, free, so you can take a look, right? I mean, that's that's the investment on the the instructor size um but the link i send is uh, this is just for math um I, I i'm sure well i'm not sure actually perhaps other disciplines also have something like this this is the american institute of mathematics right and they have a open textbook initiative so that does mathematicians review those open source resources right and um so they make recommendations and uh one of our former colleague he, he retired um josh jennings professor josh jennings is also involved in that uh, he's on that committee yeah. that makes the decision yeah yeah, yeah. 
So every, that's how I know about all it. All these have to be taken with a grain of salt, of course, because for, for example, this uh, 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 American uh, Institute of Mathematics uh, committee rejected the book, the complex analysis book, did not recommend it because they didn't like the jokes in that book, which is, I, I thought it was not a serious reason to reject, especially that I well, liked, didn't like it. <laughs> so. No jokes allowed in math. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, uh, but this, this is one of them. But first, uh, the, the library has an extensive list with, with, uh, of resources, open access resources. So uh, those are pretty good. And then, as, as Wei Yan said, uh, Google. And now, so in can... math, there's a lot of things related to computations. So nowadays, people found resources from GitHub, for example. Mm. This is like a huge open source web for programming communities, right? So, mm -hmm. so um, yeah, most of the books, you know, that, well, at least the one that I use, you can find the GitHub uh, site. They hold the whole, whole book everything right it's really mm -hmm. the, even, the source are there you can even yeah. use the source and change the book the, uh, exactly the, you, you, you like that so yeah. the guy who the author of the program sage that uh, uh Wei mentioned uh he's a mathematician and he wrote a book that he published with springer which is a big publishing house and at that time he obtained from springer the permission to make this uh, free for everybody, right, online, uh, which is not no longer, uh, a, such an option is no longer available these days. But at the time he did that, uh, his name is William Stein. So he has a book that is published in Springer and it's accessible, it's free to access online. And there are lots of books from the American Mass Society that are free. Uh, the, yeah. I mean, the only uh, version, you have to buy the print copy, which is not, yeah. it's reasonable, yeah, yeah. It's like, uh, like 20, 30, 40 dollars. Yeah, so, so, so Stein, yeah, the Stein mentions, yeah, he's definitely, he's the founder of this software, um, Sage software, and, but, but lots of people contribute to that thing, I should definitely say that. Not, not have the impression that's just one person who did the whole thing, but he's, yeah, definitely the founder and got the whole things run up and running, so, yeah. Fair enough. Uh, that's a, uh, something I probably wouldn't have thought of, is looking at your sort of disciplinary uh, institutions or institutes or uh, organizations related to that discipline and seeing if they have recommendations or uh, stockpiles like that. Uh, so Ron, you mentioned uh, that we have ones through the library. I should uh, do a shout out for Merlot, which was an open source uh, database repository that started here in the CSUs. We um, also have Cool for Ed. Uh, we've recently made some uh, agreements with Pressbooks to have access to Pressbooks and their um, software and uh, uh, resources as well. So yeah, there's a lot of, uh, it seems like there's a lot out there. And then it's just a matter of spending the time to uh, find one that you like and you think is, is high quality. Cool. Uh, well, we have about 10 minutes left. Um, I guess I want to go around one more time and say, is there anything that we haven't touched on that you think is, you know, what's the one thing you want people to take away from this discussion as far as your experience with OER, where you think OER is going in the future? Um, no pressure, sum it up in a sentence. <laughs> so, so I think OER give both the students and the faculty is a lot of freedom. Um, as we point out, where you can sort of modify, micro modify the materials if they're really open source to suit your needs. Um, yeah, and certainly without like, like for free access, um, this helps students on their finances. So, so I think that's very important. And, um, yeah, so, so the most important point is one need to really spend time because, you know, everyone can put out something for free, right? And 
it's very important for the faculty to sort of spend time. You can write your own, you can, but but definitely if we will use the open source, it's not just like found one, right? I mean, it's, it's need to, even if on that, you one need to spend some time to pick out a good one. That's why, okay, yeah. Perfect. Yeah, I can't. I can't make a prediction, unfortunately. But I, I, I do like the the concept, and I, I, I hope that it will continue to grow as we have seen it grow the, in the recent years. And I think that one of the things that we really need to get out, and this is a messaging thing, this is a cultural thing, this is a prejudice thing, um, and uh, both my colleagues have mentioned this: is students thinking that if it's a free book or a low cost book, then it must not be a very good book. And so we've got to get it out there that this is a textbook that was written by people who write textbooks, you know, not, we're not stupid, um, but we're doing it because these free resources are needed because there's so many students who cannot afford the, you know, the big publishers, you know, $300 textbook or even $100 textbook, it's still a lot of money. And I know that there will probably be folks saying, well, how are we supposed to get compensated for our work if we don't sell a textbook and get royalties from it? Well, maybe we should have grants instead. And maybe we should stop thinking of, you know, especially if a textbook comes out every two years with a brand new edition, you know, I don't know. I just, for me, competition is a really, a thing that I really don't like. And I would like to have less of it and more collaboration. And I think that sometimes we have to realize that the students need it, we could provide it, and there's no reason that we can't be compensated fairly for our time with a grant. Um, but maybe that's how we should shift how we think about, about course resources, about textbooks in general, not just, you know, oh, I'm going to write a, a big juicy textbook and I'm going to get compensated with gigantic royalties, you know, I mean, really, does that ever happen? You know, maybe about as often as a fiction writer gets a bestseller. Right. I mean, it's still then why not get grant money, which is, you know, something we can depend on and write an OER textbook and then make that available to all the criminology students out there who are taking intro to crim or all of the students who are taking a race and gender class, you know, and I don't I don't see why there's so much resistance to that. Um, and so it might be a good idea to put it out there that, hey, I'm working on an OER textbook. I just drop that into conversation. You know, I'm working on an OER textbook on this thing that doesn't have one yet, or on this thing where there's three books on it, but none of them cover this concept that I think is integral to students understanding calculus, or you know, whatever it is that you're that you're doing, um, because we're not going to be able to change the way students see it unless we can change the way faculty and administrators see it, so that they can see this as not just you know, let's put together some cheap crap that the students can then get for free, it's going to be, let's put together some well thought out, well explained textbooks that are made available to students because we know that their budgets are not gigantic. They do not have, you know, $1,200 lying around for four textbooks every semester. They just don't, you know? And, and I think that it also would require us to sue just kind of make compassion the priority instead of what can we get out of it as the priority i don't know if that makes sense but that's kind of where i come from yeah i love that as a yeah. as a summary mm -hmm. come at coming at it from a place of compassion and a place of understanding for mm -hmm. the the student perspective yeah well i love that as an ending point um i do want to mention that we will be having our uh annual faculty recognition event. Uh, so celebrating all of the three of you, hopefully I will see you there, uh, maybe or maybe not. Um, and all of our other faculty across uh, Dominguez Hills who have taken steps to help save students money by either providing an OER material or working with the bookstore on an immediate access book or some other, you know, something available through the library, uh, but basically trying to make that compassion uh, the point. Um, well, thank you all so much for uh, joining us. I'm going to go ahead and end the recording now.